Well, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21 tonight. We will uh, conclude chapter 21 tonight as we uh, look at uh, the rest of uh, chapter 21. We'll be in ver- starting in verse uh, verse 9, but I'm going to ask Stacy if he'll put up our timeline. He, it's almost like he knew that's what I was going to ask for. Uh, but just to recap, because we've only got two weeks left to recap and remind you of all that we have covered. You know, we have covered over 2,000 years of world history and church history in the time that, uh, actually 3,000 years, uh, if you look at it in that regard. But uh, we, we talked about the church age leading up through, the, through chapters 1, 2, and 3, and how those churches that, Paul, or that uh, John wrote to uh, were um, churches that were literally in his day brick-and-mortar churches, but also how those churches... Uh, would sort of uh, speak to the time periods of the church. And then we talked in chapter 4 about the rapture, about John being raptured to heaven and how that's symbolic of the rapture of the church. And then how there would be the seven years of the tribulation. And we spent a great deal of time talking about all the things that would happen during the tribulation time. And then uh, we talked about the glorious appearing of Christ, that return to earth Uh, We talked about that and how uh, He would return and bring with Him those that have put their faith in Him, including you and I. And then how He would set up a millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Christ will rule and reign on the earth. You and I will rule and reign with Him. And uh, when that time period is done, will be uh, the the great white throne judgment where uh, those that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ Uh, they will be thrown into hell. God does His final judgment. And Satan is, uh, just prior to that, Satan is uh, banished to hell uh, with where the false prophet and the Antichrist were. And what we've talked about last week was we start, okay, after the, after the great judgment, after judgment day, as we would call it, uh, we talked about how, what would happen. And we started talking about the, uh, the new heaven and the new earth and what would happen there. And so we're, what we'll do here in a moment is we're going to actually start back at verse 1 of chapter 21 to remind us of what we're talking about in the context of chapter 21. And so as we do, I want you to turn back to the very first verse of chapter 21. And Stacy, you can go ahead and take us where we need to in the notes in the, on, on the uh, video. But as we do, I want you to read with me uh, as we've talked about. Uh, this new Jerusalem in uh, Revelation chapter 21. And so it says in uh, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now what we, what we see there, we see him talking about this, uh, how the earth that we're on right now will be done away with. It will pass away. And the atmospheric heaven, not the stars, although the stars could be included in that, uh, but the atmospheric heaven will be uh, passed away as well. And it says, uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them, uh, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And so right there, we see so far that what will happen is that when God uh, does away with this heaven and this earth, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And out of, uh, I I would say, uh, what we would understand to be the spiritual realm, uh, God is going to lower, or as John puts it, there will be a new Jerusalem coming to this earth. There won't be an old Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a part of this world. And so when this world is gone, Jerusalem, Charlotte, New York, all those places will be gone. But on the new earth, God is going to place a new Jerusalem like we were talking about there. But it tells us that God is going to be in the midst of His people there. And so uh, look at verse 5. It says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That means everything. Everything. And so he says, then he said, write this down for this, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And so right here, John reiterates, or God reiterates through John, that in all of creation there are two beings, or two types of people that God sees. He sees believers and non-believers. There's no, there's no two ways about it. That's what he sees. And he tells us up to the very end, that's all he sees. Those that have put their faith in Christ and those who have not. And so that's where we pick up tonight is talking about this new Jerusalem. All we saw was that it is coming down out of the clouds. It, land, you know, it, it is placed on earth and that's it. And so that's where we're picking up tonight in verses 9 through 27. And so... We're going to read verses 9 through 27, and then we're going to go back and we're going to break it all down. It sounds like it's going to be a lot, but it won't take us very long because the information is very clear. So look at verses 9 through 27 with me. It says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and that's talking about the angels that brought the bowl judgments, okay? So one of those angels comes to John and says, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of, the heaven, from, out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel like a jasper clear as crystal it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with the 12 angels at the gates on the on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of israel there were three gates on the east three on the north three on the south and three on the west the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as wide as it as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was one hundred and forty four cubits thick by man's measurement which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper in the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, Chaldensia, or Chalcedonia, Chalcedonia, the fourth emerald, uh, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth was uh, cryoprase, the eleventh was jacinth, and the twelfth was amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great, the great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Oh, no day, uh, on no day will its uh, gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does, not, does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so what we see here is that that John gets a, a, a vision of this beautiful city that comes down and uh, this new Jerusalem. And this is honestly like the thing, you know, the type of things that we would expect in uh, fairy tales or science fiction and things like that. It just sounds so unbelievable. And the reason it does is because our finite minds can only comprehend so much of it. But here is the thing. John, as a human, 
is trying his best to relay to you what he saw and how he could relay it to us in terms that we would understand. It's sort of like the missionary who goes to the jungle and tries to explain to someone who has never used anything but a mud stove, a mud type uh, heating element in their home for their cooking, trying to explain to them a gas or electric range. How do you explain that? With no concept of what they're talking about. It's like talking to uh, someone who has only ever had a cool stream in front of their hut and trying to explain to them refrigeration and air conditioning and things like that. It's hard to explain when you have no concept of what is being shared. So you use what you can to try and relay the message. And that's what John is doing. And so he's trying to tell us all he can about this new Jerusalem. And so the first thing we see is there, as it says, that this new Jerusalem, it's referred to as the bride of Christ. But let me ask you, we've already talked about the bride of the Lamb or the marriage supper of the Lamb. And who was the bride in that regard? Do you remember? Who is the bride of Christ? The church. Right. And so how can this new Jerusalem be the bride and the church be the bride of Christ? And that's one of the things that we're going to look at uh, now because what we understand is... Uh, you know, the author does a really good job in the commentary that we're using to explain that a city, the streets and the buildings don't constitute what really is the city. Who makes up a particular city? The people in the city. The residents of the city make up the city. Without them, there is no city. You just have buildings and roads. But with people, that is who makes up the city. So, when we think about it in this regard, this new Jerusalem, yes, it's going to have these beautiful buildings, these streets of gold and things like that, but that is not the bride. The bride of Christ is going to occupy that city. And who is the bride of Christ? You and I, the church. And so we will occupy that city, and not just New Testament believers, Old Testament believers, uh, those that have come to faith in Christ across the generations. But what we see is that uh, that New Jerusalem, even though it's referred to as the Bride of Christ, it's just a, a, a place of residence for the Bride of Christ, which is uh, the Christian. And so uh, one of the things it talks about there in your notes is that this city is the crowning feature of the creation of God. And it is going to be the unique habitation of the redeemed for eternity. This is going to be what we know to be heaven. Okay. Remember, we have talked about this last week, that when, when Great Aunt Bessie passes away and people say, oh, she got her angel's wings. No, she didn't get angel's wings because angels are a created being. Humans don't get angel's wings. And when somebody says, well, oh, Great Aunt Bessie, she's walking in the streets of gold. She's made it through the pearly gates. Well, not exactly. We've talked last week about the place of paradise that we would refer to as heaven until this heaven is put on the new until this new Jerusalem is placed on the new earth and so what we understand to be the streets of gold and the pearly gates yes great aunt Bessie if she was a Christian she's going to get to walk those streets of gold but not as quickly as we sometimes tend to say they will and so what we understand though is that this new Jerusalem that will be placed on the new earth and in the new heaven so to speak that will be our place for eternity that is going to be our heaven because we, when we refer to heaven, we, who is in heaven? God. And we go to spend eternity in heaven with Him. That's how we usually phrase it. You know, do you want to be a Christian? Well, if you're a Christian, then you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you get eternal life and you get a place in heaven for eternity. You're, you're with God for eternity in heaven. We say phrases like that. This new Jerusalem is that heaven. That is our concept of heaven that we will be in that new Jerusalem with God forever. Now, it tells us about this city, uh, this new Jerusalem in uh, verses 12 through 21. And it tells us that it's going to have this great big wall. And that tells us one thing. A wall is used to what? what why do you normally have a wall or a fence? Let's, let's think about it from our rural context. If I have a fence, I, I want to try, I'm trying to do what? I'm trying to separate two things. I'm either trying to keep the cows from the hayfield or the cows in the hayfield, one or the other, right? I'm trying to keep 
you know, you're trying to keep two things divided. This wall, that this great big wall that was 144 cubits, which is from the fingertip to the elbow of an average man, uh, that's a cubit, it's about 18 inches. Uh, it was 144 cubits thick, and it was 12,000 stadia long, which is 1,500 miles, okay? And so this great big wall around this huge city is there as a reminder, and that's it. Because there will never be a night, as the scripture says, and so there, that means there's no reason to close the gates. The only reason they closed the gates, why do you close your doors at night? Because to, to, for safety, right? To keep, to keep that separation. We close our doors as a means of safety during the night because you never know what lurks in the night, so to speak. You don't know if the bad guy is out there or something like that, so we're going to lock our doors. And we do that to cause a separation between us and them. Well, the, the thing about this new wall is that even though it will have gates made of pearl that are so large that one, uh, they're going to be bigger than a man because they are a gate, you know, and so these gates will never be closed because there will never be night because God will always be there. And we'll talk about that. But this, this wall around this city is nothing more than a reminder that not everyone has access to God at this point because there are those that are in hell that will be there for eternity just like there are those that are inside the wall that will be there for eternity in heaven with God. And so, uh, as, we, as we talk about it, this stadia that uh, we were talking about earlier, I told you last week that this city is going to be the, the equivalent of, uh, from the eastern seaboard to the, uh, to the Mississippi River, and from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border. It's actually just a little larger than that. I looked at it on Google Maps and I wanted to show you a fancy map with that on there. But the problem is Google Maps takes in the curvature of the earth and it looks really weird. Uh, but nevertheless, it is from the, the northern Montana border down into Mexico. And that far high, that, that long and as wide as you know, most of our United States. I mean, it's, it's a huge section that, is, that we could relate it to. But that's how big this city is going to be. And there, we don't know how many people will be there. There will be more people, according to estimates from Bible scholars, there will be more people in heaven than there are in hell. But even at a, a conservative estimate of 20 billion people, because you've got to remember, we have the, the millennia uh, that Christ will be on the earth, and people will still be having children during that time, and one thing and another, but... The est with an estimated population of 20 billion people, then each person would enjoy a block of space of approximately one cubic mile. Is that enough room for you? If you got some of those in-laws or outlaws that you don't necessarily want to uh, sit next to at, at Thanksgiving or some other time, you can get away from them. You say, go to your place, I'm going to go to my place, and you won't even be able to see them. Uh, it's that sort of uh, space. We're talking about a huge amount of area. And remember, this is going to be on a new earth. And so we don't know the, the dimensions of that new earth. It may just barely fit this new Jerusalem. There may be a whole lot more uh, room outside of the new Jerusalem. We just don't know. Uh, but what we're talking about is huge amounts of area. And, you know, the building materials of this city are building materials that we today do not use because of their expense. And, you know, how many of us are going to use gold to pave our driveway? You can't afford to do that. How many of us are going to use precious stones as the foundations in our home? We're not going to do that. We can't afford to. Even on the, uh, what is it, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, they can't even afford to do that uh, because of the expense of those things. But those things will be so cheap, so to speak, in heaven that God will use them. You know, he'll use gold to pave the streets. And so uh, we see that this city is made uh, out of these precious stones and, and uh, valuable uh, uh, stones and things like that. Uh, but we see that in this city, there will be no temple in the city. Now, in Jerusalem, during Jesus' day, and even until 70 AD, and from the time of uh, Solomon, which would have been about 1000 AD, I mean 1000 BC, so for 1000 plus years, the center of the city of Jerusalem was the temple. And so that was, that was the center of the city to some degree. 
And so when this new Jerusalem comes, there will be no temple because God's throne will be moved from heaven as we know it today, that third heaven. It will be placed in that new Jerusalem and that will be where God will be with His people. And so, you know, from the very beginning of creation, uh, God has chosen to fellowship with us. As it says there in your notes, He's chosen to fellowship with us and to have a relationship with us. Think about it. Even from Adam and Eve's time, you know, after they were kicked out of the uh, Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel knew what it meant to worship God through sacrifices. They gave sacrifices to God and they knew what it meant to have a relationship and fellowship with Him. And ever since then, ever since Adam and Eve were in the garden and they knew what it meant to spend time in the cool of the evening walking with the Lord, ever since then, they have all, mankind has always had fellowship with God through the altar sacrifices, through the tabernacle, through Jesus' incarnation, and even through the Holy Spirit dwelling in the believers as we talked about this morning. Uh, we, we know that God has always been with us. Now, in this new Jerusalem, in this eternal order, as it will be called, or as it's called, uh, there will no longer be a need for a temple for us to go and worship God, for God to have His place of residence. If you remember when Solomon dedicated the temple, the Spirit of God came and rested in the Holy of Holies, and it was God's way of being with His people all the time. They could go to the temple, and they couldn't go into the Holy of Holies simply because they weren't supposed to, but once a year, or you know, they're to offer the sacrifice. But we see that they had the opportunity to go to the temple and be in the presence of God to some degree. Well, when this new Jerusalem is placed on earth and God puts His throne in the midst of this new Jerusalem, God is, is pretty much saying, here I am, I'm going to be with you for eternity and you're going to be in my presence. And so we'll be in, in God's presence and His glory will light this city. We, there will be no reason for us to ever uh, doubt Him because He will be there with us. We will see Him. We will fellowship with Him. We'll be in His presence. But as, uh, as the next thing in your notes talks about, God will be the light of the city. It said that God is the light and Jesus is the lamp of the city. And so what that's telling us is that God will light that city. You remember when I talked about the walls of the city, that there was no reason to close the gates because there would be no night. And so if there's no night, that means that there is constantly a source of light. Even here on earth, you know, if we sit in here for a few more hours, it's going to get dark unless we leave the lights on because the sun is rotating or the earth is rotating around the uh, around the sun and on its axis and there is a time of night for us but in that new Jerusalem it will be light all the time now I'm not one that run, I'm one that runs on a, you know a small amount of sleep most nights but for those of you who like to take a nap uh, my wife is one of those uh, for people who like to take a nap I don't know what to tell you uh, because unless you pull the covers over your head and take a nap, I don't know how I don't know how you get rest. I don't even know if we'll need rest. Uh, those glorified bodies may not need the same kind of rest that we need now, but there will never be any dark. There will be never be any darkness. Uh, you know, uh, the in your notes it references First John one five where it says God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all, and we understand that to be a reference to sin. But that's a good example of us understanding what it means for the, uh, the new Jerusalem. God is going to be the source of light. He's going to be the energizer bunny, so to speak, for our uh, eternal uh, order there in the city of in the new Jerusalem. Uh, one thing that, um, that we see here that he talks about in uh, Revelation is that everyone will also have access to the holy city. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone that is a believer in Christ. Okay, They are the only ones that will be in this new heaven, in this new earth, and in this new Jerusalem. Believers are the only ones that will be there, those that have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what that says there is, though, that we will all have access to the holy city. We'll all have access to our area uh, in this uh, new Jerusalem. We'll have access to... God. We will be able to see Him face to face. We will be able to spend time in His presence. Uh, and regardless of what nationality you are, regardless of, 
of whether you were a king in this life or a prince or a president or some uh, government official with a high rank, regardless of where you are and what your station is in life, whether you're a, a king or just a regular person, every one of us will have access to the holy city and to this new Jerusalem, but we'll also have access to God. And so that's, uh, that helps us to understand uh, that we have uh, complete access to Him. But if believers are those, the redeemed from all of these generations, are the ones that have access to the city and access to God, that means that outside that wall, so, so to speak, in hell, separated from the presence of God, meaning that hell will not be on that new earth. Hell will not be in that new heaven. Hell will be completely removed from the presence of God in some way that God in His infinite power and wisdom has designed. But what we know is that there will be some that are excluded from that holy city. And it's, it's those that do not have a relationship with Christ. God explained it again in Revelation 21 earlier that there are only two kinds of people when God looks at us. He sees those that are believers and those that are unbelievers. And those that are unbelievers are going to be excluded from this holy city. And, and as it says there in your notes, in essence, only by acceptance of Jesus Christ does anyone have access to the ultimate blessing that God has prepared for him or her. Only through Christ do we have access to that holy city, that new Jerusalem, in that new earth and, uh, and in that new heaven. And, you know, one of the things that we we read about in the Gospels is when Jesus says, what does He tell us? I am going to what? He's going to prepare a place for us. This new Jerusalem is what He is preparing for us. And that is what, that, this is the place. You know, we talk about uh, mansions in heaven. Well, in this new Jerusalem, that may very well be what our homes will be like or the places, our residences, as we might understand it. But things will be so different in heaven than what we could ever imagine that it just, it's going to be hard for us. I think it's going to be a, a, a real culture shock for us when we get to heaven and then eventually make it through the tribulation and the millennial kingdom or millennial reign of Christ and get to this new Jerusalem. I think it's going to, all of that's going to just, it would blow our earthly minds, I think. And so God in His infinite grace is going to give us the ability to comprehend and understand everything that He has for us. But how wonderful is that, that, that God has told us in the Gospels that He is going, Jesus is going to go and prepare a place for us. And we in the book of Revelation get to read about that place and, and, and learn about that place and find out what it takes for us to get to that place. And that's what he does. He tells us all about it. And, you know, uh, from our perspective, it's been 2,000 years since Christ left earth and went to prepare this place. You could do a lot of work in 2,000 years. I mean, think about it. You could accomplish a lot of things. But as we know, the Bible tells us that uh, to God, you know, a day is as if a thousand years and a thousand years is as if a day. And so for us, it's like Jesus has only been working for a couple of days. And you know what? If it takes him a couple more days to get it done, that's okay with me because I see what the finished product is here in Revelation chapter 21. And so this is where we come to. We come to the end of the book of Revelation. And next week, we will uh, finish out our study uh, by looking at Genesis, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 22.